morning. So the keynote was great and I thoroughly enjoyed it and not being a security but a networking guy, I can tell you the whole thing applies to networking as well. So whatever he was telling you about security, he could be telling you the same thing about networking. By the way, there are like few chairs around here. Uh, so we all have the same set of problems. And as you can see, I've been doing loads of crazy stuff in the past, and now I am this grumpy old man that is focused on networking. And everyone who is looking at the networking from the outside has the same opinion about networking than they have about security. Those guys are always saying no, and they're not moving anywhere. Networking is the same as it has been for the last 50 years. Which is not true, by the way, but it looks like that from the outside. Anyway, a few years back, uh, a certain thing started to pop up as huge hype called software-defined networking. Uh, and I made it my mission to debunk that hype. So now I am on a crusade. I'm telling people why SDN, as promoted by the academics, will never work. And most of the old networking engineers go like, yeah, we thought so. Uh, anyway, lost in that high P argument is the real gem, which is we need to change the way we do things. And in networking, there are a few people that are actively evangelizing network automation. So instead of dealing with your network box by box, maybe you should deal with your network on a slightly higher level. And of course, if you take a look at white papers from any network management vendor, they will tell you that they've been doing that for the last 20 years and we know how well that worked. Anyway, there are people trying to solve this problem in networking and there are organizations that are actually using those things in production networks. So this is not just a dream. For example, um, I was speaking with a guy from Spotify, you know, the company that streams music over the internet. They have this huge data center and he doesn't have time to deploy new data center switches manually. So he built this system where they just plug in a new switch and the switch gets the config automatically and the network is reconfigured automatically. And uh, he said, I haven't logged into my switch in over two years. Any switch. It's all automated. And now he's doing the same thing with his Fortinet firewalls, which gave me a great idea. Hey, let's look at how people are doing security stuff and can we do the same thing in the security field? And I limited the whole thing to network security because that's the thing I may know a little bit about. After all, I was building firewalls 30 years back with two routers and a bastion host. So maybe uh, the things that we have learned in networking are applying to security as well. Anyway. Any time I talk, because this is a management track, I'll start with a management slide. Any time I talk with a manager, I throw up this slide, and he or she goes like, how do you know my problems? And they're really not hard to guess. So reduce costs, but be more flexible. And the applications have to be deployed faster, but we can't manage that and we have to compete with the public cloud. And I'll mention public cloud a few slides later. Anyway, how many of you run a data center? Okay, how many of those data centers look fundamentally like this? Yeah, more or less all of them. Every enterprise data center I've seen so far is built like this. You have this pair of huge bo hugely expensive huge boxes in the middle. And then, then you have VLANs, hopefully across only one data center. There are people who are brave enough to run them across multiple data centers. I wish them luck. 
uh, and all the traffic between any two subnets goes between this choke point. And then, of course, everyone is complaining why the network is slow. The network is not slow. It's the choke point that is slow. So with this in mind, how long does it take you to create and deploy a new firewall rule in production? Any guesses? Two days. Anyone else? Too long. Huh? Too long. Yeah, that's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in real life data centers, if you track your metrics, it turns out it's between a few days and a week or longer. The first problem is that there are so many people manually touching that request. The second problem is that someone has to manually type that into the firewall or into the firewall management system. And the third problem is that he can only do that during the maintenance window. And the maintenance window is every fifth Friday of the month uh, at 5 AM <laughs> for five minutes. Anyway, the real problem is, what if we would consider this from the moment someone said, I need a firewall rule, to the moment his application was actually working? And it turns out that in most cases, these two things are the same, but there are outliers that raise the average to 10 days or more. For example, someone says, I need access to this web server on UDP port 80. Now, why would an application engineer need to know about UDP? That's the first question. But that's how we deal with things. So he says UDP port 80, and a moron typing that in types in UDP port 80 instead of asking that guy, hey, did you really mean TCP port 80? And of course, then he says, I'm done. During the next maintenance window, the firewall rule is implemented, and he runs away. And then the application guy, three days later, checks it and says, it doesn't work. So he opens a troubleshooting ticket. The firewall rule doesn't work. Then you have to bring in a more experienced guy who can actually troubleshoot stuff. And he troubleshoots that, and he figures out that, yeah, maybe you meant TCP port 80. So will you fix it? No, I can't fix it. You have to open two new tickets to remove the old rule and to add a new rule. That's how things work in practice in real life. And then compared to that, those same application people can do this. And this is UI from Amazon VPC Cloud. In Amazon, they can configure whatever they wish. And they can deploy it now. There's no maintenance window at Amazon. So is there any wonder that they're trying to run away? And the only thing keeping them back are compliance rules? We are doing something fundamentally wrong. But it's not just a security problem. It's a bigger problem. So why does this work? First reason, they have simple rules. There is no deep packet inspection. There is no uh, stateful stuff. There is no application level gateway. Amazon will not deal with SIP or FTP. You either allow certain things to certain port, like TCP port 80, which by the way, they tell you it's HTTP. You don't have to guess the port number, and you don't have to guess whether it's TCP or UDP. Someone actually spent more than three seconds on the user interface and its usability, which some vendors never did. And uh, the second thing is it's configured by the application owners, which scares away any security expert I ever talk with. This thing will only work if you make the application owners responsible for their own shit, excuse the word. <laughs> if you think that you are the guy fixing their mistakes afterwards, you will never move forward. 
I'm not saying that the application people have to know what TCP port 80 is. I'm saying they should be responsible. Of course, they can get an external expert, you, or you, or whoever, to help them figure that thing out. But you know, in IT, we are extremely bad at delegating things and asking for help. If you have your lawyer in your company and someone sues your company, that lawyer is not stupid enough to go to court. He will hire an ex external expert who knows what the court proceedings are, and he will pay those guys also to cover his ass. And in IT, we think that we can solve any problem with the help of Uncle Google. So this is why it works for Amazon, and this is why it does not work for us. And in Amazon, you can deploy this in real time. By the way, I've heard about clouds where you use a GUI like this, and then you press submit, and then it opens a trouble ticket for the firewall team. which is not how things are supposed to be working. This has to be deployed in real time. And if you want to deploy this in real time, you can't have a team of people sitting in India typing this in. You have to automate the network security. Okay? So we want to get to this land of pixies and unicorns where you will have the application requirements and you will have the security policies and there's a prancing unicorn here, which is called security orchestration system. And this thing will combine all these things together and deploy them automatically to your firewalls, load balancers, what have you. I mean, we are on a different planet. This thing exists in some small measure in Amazon Cloud and a few other places, we are still on a different planet. We're not even getting close. Uh, and even Amazon doesn't have this thing. You have to know what your application needs. There is no way someone else can figure out what your application needs. It's the academics would tell you it's the halting problem. You cannot figure out whether a program will halt or not, and someone has proven that. And you cannot figure out what an application needs just by looking at it. Okay? So there are people who have tried to do this, and mostly they have failed because you cannot capture all the possible code paths in the application. Anyway, so how do we get to something realistic? The first thing you have to do is if you want to get anything done, you have to simplify the mess that you have today. What everyone has today is a bunch of exceptions. Every application is different, even though they were all coded using the same tools. But every application has some special requirements that you have to implement at the last minute. So, you have to simplify. Once you got down to a reasonable set of things you need to do, then you can standardize those things. For example, uh, okay. let's take an example. How many of you are using, for example, JBoss with Oracle? Okay. Uh, and all your applications are written in JBoss and use Oracle. But some of them are, okay? So, why can't you have a security profile saying, for a JBoss application using Oracle, I need this inbound rules, this rules between the app and the database tier, and those rules between the web and the app tier. And you standardize that. And then when the new application comes along, well, you publish that in advance. This is how we will support JBoss applications with Oracle. The new application comes along, you say, do you fit into this profile? And you can test that. You take your firewall, you take the application, does it work? Yes, you can deploy it. No, go back to square one. Read the documents, fix the application. 
And of course, they will go to your boss's boss and start yelling at him. At which point, you have to talk to the CFO. And you say, I can fix that for that application, but that will increase my OPEX continuously for years to come. Because I will have to support that stuff. You want me to do that? I'm fine. But it's your choice. Sign on the dotted line. Usually, that stops the discussions. But you have to be able to, make that, to have that discussion, which means that those people have to trust you, which means that you have to turn from the culture of no to the culture of let me help you. Anyway, once you have standardized, you can start automating. Because when you standardize, you know what you want to do. Before standardizing, you have no clue what you're doing. And after you put something like this in place, you can start abstracting. Once you can automate, you can start having templates. You can start saying, OK, now I can deploy a typical firewall for a JBoss plus Oracle application. And then you can make these templates available to the application people so they can deploy their own firewalls on demand. And you walk away and you lie on a bitch. And you have fun. Before you can do that, you have to reduce the blast radius. Very simple concept. If I mess up something, what's the impact? So today, with a traditional data center, if you mess up the central firewall, what's the impact? If it crashes, your data center is gone. Obviously, no one allows you to touch that firewall in real time. Because if you mess that up, your data center is gone. That's why we have maintenance windows. Okay? So how do you get away from that? The first thing is you virtualize everything. Instead of one huge firewall in front of the data center, why don't you have 50 small firewalls in front of individual applications? And then is the question for the application team. When do you want to update the rules? I mean, it's your firewall. I can do it at 10 AM if you're fine with that. And the people who own the travel expenses application will go like, yeah, sure. And the people who own the e-commerce application will go like, mm, maybe that's not a good idea. But you have the choice. Today, you don't have the choice. Today, you treat the travel expenses application the same way you treat the mission-critical e-commerce application, because they're both on the same firewall. Okay? So whenever I talk about virtualizing, I get this problem, well, complain that, well, you know, but we have gigabits of traffic. And a virtual machine can never do that, which is definitely no longer true. Some theoretical maximums. Someone from Switzerland, well, an, an Australian coming to Switzerland through Sweden, managed to push 2000, uh, 200 gig through a Xeon server, an x86 server with two cores. So the bus is not the problem. Uh, Intel pushed 50 mega packets per second through I don't know how many cores, which is 130 gig. So. Performance is not a problem. Even on Linux, people were pushing 50 gig through a Xeon server with multipath TCP. Obviously, they could do that because they were using TCP offload. But yet again, you can do that. And here are some commercial numbers. Uh, A10 load balancer can get up to 4 gig on a single core. You know how many cores you have in a modern server. OK? Uh, by the way, how many of you have 10 gig uplinks to the internet or faster? A few. Good. For everyone else, this is good enough. For those of you who have faster uplinks, obviously, you have to do a few other things. And uh, one of them is you don't have one outside IP address. You have many. So you split that on multiple load balancers. And if you have one outside IP address with more than 10 gig of traffic coming to it, I have a few tricks for you. F5 is a bit slower. 
VMware NSX Edge Services Router, which was just fancy GUI on top of Linux, is now a bit faster, so they do 10 gig firewalling and 4 to 10 gig load balancing on two cores. Not bad. Juniper Firefly, 1.1 gig with iMix and 4.1 gig with uh, maximum size UDP packets. So, 4 gig when they just switch packets back and forth. Um, oh, and you can use any one of these if you have 1 gig uplinks. Like Palo Alto claims 1 gig at 4 vCPUs, but they were telling me they were doing it. That number is with full blown deep packet inspection testing. So, with features turned on. Whereas NSX X Services Router is, let's be honest, just reflexive access control lists. It's stateful because when a packet comes in, they install the reverse flow in the firewall table. That's as stateful as they are compared to, let's say, follow out the firewall, which is for real. Vayata can do 10 gig of firewalling and routing on one core. I mean, this should be good enough. The showstopper is uh, SSL transactions per second. That's the real showstopper. The best number I've seen was 3,000 transactions per second. But the showstopper is RSA. So the moment you start using elliptic curve certificates, you go, you go way beyond that. That's why Cloudflare can offer SSL offload for free. If you don't know, cloud, on Cloudflare, you can set up your own SSL website, well, CDN, SSL to the client, HTTP over the internet to your server. Why do they do that? So I would use Cloudflare. Why would I want that? Because Google is giving higher rankings to SSL sites. Problem solved. No additional security, but I look good. Anyway, as I said, you had to minimize the complexity and standardize things. Which means that you don't have one rule set for your whole company. You don't have 10,000 rules in the central firewall. You have per application rule sets. And things like uh, NSX firewall actually allow you to do that. You can create security groups and then you can define rule sets for individual security groups. And then they analyze which VM is sitting on which hypervisor and download only those relevant rules to the hypervisor. But they are doing a reasonable job. Don't ask me how secure that stuff is. If you do this, then rule sets live and die with the application. So when you remove the application, when you decommission it, the rule set goes with the application. So there is no stale, there are no stale rules in the central firewall. I know a guy who was paid a lot of money for a three-month project which was auditing firewall rules in the central firewall of a large organization. So he was spending three months trying to figure out which ones of those were never used so they could remove them. I mean, nice money. Next, you standardize the rule sets. The applications are usually not as special as their owner thinks they are. Try to make as few standard rule sets as possible. And once you do that, your chat with the auditor will be much simpler. Because you can tell the auditor, I have these five templates, please audit them. And auditing a 20 rule template is a piece of cake. And then you go around the 100 small firewalls you have in your organization, and the auditor just looks at the firewall and says, well, does this rule set match any of the templates? If it does, fine, I'm done. If not, I have to audit it. Okay? So I'm joking that you need something like a warranty seal. You have these five standard templates with the warranty seals. The moment the application owners want to have a different rule, you tell them you have to open the box, the warranty seal will break, and you will talk to the auditor, which might persuade them to fit into the standard rule set. But it makes everyone's life so much easier. And finally, 
you have to rethink the security policy. Everyone thinks they need a stateful firewall. Everyone thinks they need a stateful firewall with deep packet inspection. And Palo Alto loves you. And a few other people. The reality is, usually packet filters within data center are good enough. What's all the traffic coming to a MySQL server? It's TCP traffic on one port number. Do you need deep packet inspection for that? No, because Palo Alto doesn't have deep packet inspection for MySQL anyway. Or maybe they do, but you get the point. Is there anything coming out of that server? Well, it shouldn't be. If there is something coming out of that server going to some weird address, you have a problem anyway. You don't need a stateful inspection of the outgoing session because there should be no outgoing sessions. Okay, so usually packet filters are good enough, but we insist on stateful inspection with application level gateways on big firewalls just because the security policy says so. Maybe we don't need them. And the one thing you can do is once you figure out that packet filters or statefulish packet filters might be good enough, you can go from this old world of centralized firewalls to the brave new world where you put small firewalls in front of the virtual machines. And once you do that, you become infinitely scalable. The more virtual machines you have, the more physical servers you have, the more CPU power you have, the more distributed CPU power for the firewalling you have. No choke point. And finally, Try to decouple the virtual and the physical world as much as possible. Try to make everything as virtual as you can. I'll show you why. Let's imagine that you manage to virtualize the whole application stack. Firewall, load balancer, virtual machines, everything is virtualized. Okay? Because it's virtualized, it's using virtual disks. It has all the configuration on those virtual disks, which are just files on a file system, which is replicated to a different data center. Now your data center burns down. What do you have to do to recover? You just restart those VMs in a different data center. It may even be Amazon Cloud. Because everything is virtualized, you can move it around at will. Not live. I'm not, I'm not telling you you can move a VM from East Coast to West Coast. That's VMware's job. Uh, but you can move the workload anywhere if you have virtualized everything in the workload, including the network services. And of course, every time I show a picture like this, more conservative organizations go like, ah, uh, no. So for them, I have this recipe. You use the standard physical firewall that does the basic scrubbing, and then you have the scrubbed segment where you have the shared caches and proxy servers, and then you have per tenant virtual appliances and the application stack. Okay? So, Enough of theory, let's see what other people are doing. First, multi-tenant isolation with firewalls. Everyone has this today. So if you are willing to go down this path, you have plenty of commercial products that you can use today. And every cloud orchestration system that, well, every popular cloud orchestration system is supporting this idea. OpenStack does this with either IP tables or vendor plugin. CloudStack does this, but only on KVM because they use IP tables. In theory, CloudStack could do this on Hyper-V because Hyper-V also has stateful firewall in the kernel, but no one ever wrote the code to support it. But hey, OpenStack is open source, feel free to write the code. 
Uh, VMware NSX Juniper Contrail has something similar. Hyper-V, as I said, has stateful firewall in kernel. So if you think that this is a good idea, you can go out and start using this today. And once you deploy either VMware NSX or CloudStack or OpenStack, you also get the same GUI that Amazon has. Well, similar, functionally similar. So if you think that you can push this problem onto the application people, at least for pilot deployments, go for it. There's no reason why you shouldn't be doing it. Um, the other beautiful thing you get once you start deploying this stuff is that this, either you have the security groups in the cloud orchestration system, or you have the firewall management system like Panorama, tightly integrated with the cloud orchestration system, which means that you no longer have to deal with IP addresses. You can defy a security group saying, web servers are all VMs where the name starts with web. Database servers are all VMs that run Linux and the name starts with DB. And then in Panorama or in the uh, NSX manager, you create a rule that says web servers can talk to database servers on port whatever MySQL port is. And as you add new machines, they may get random IP addresses, but the management system will adjust the firewall rules, which still use IP addresses, obviously, in real time. Which means that finally you can stop thinking about subnets. How cool is that? Uh, and now a few other things people are doing. Uh, is any one of you using TAP aggregation network in the data center? Good. Uh, for those of you who, are, who don't have a TAP aggregation network, how do you do uh, troubleshooting with Wireshark? You run around with laptops? How do you get the traffic from a span port to your Wireshark probe? Hmm? Okay, you can do remote span. Yeah, that's true, that works as well. Uh, so there, uh, how do you bring traffic from a, a passive probe on a link? So anyway, you get the point. Uh, large data centers usually have TAP aggregation networks. And uh, it's either span ports or passive TAPs on core links. And there are like three or four different companies that have these reassuringly expensive products that can do the TAP aggregation. Gigamon, for example, is one of them. And it turns out that those products are nothing else than top of rack switches with special software. So people like Arista said, well, why don't we turn our switches into that? Okay? I will have some TAP ports, I will have some tool ports, I can build a fabric of these switches, and I can program them in real time. And Microsoft is using this inside their data center because they can program these switches in real time through JSON, which means that you can write a simple web application that will program your TAP aggregation network. So you say, I need to see that port on that Wireshark probe Bam, you have it. But still, we are at the point where we are doing span. Either with OpenFlow, or yet again, Arista has a solution where they don't need OpenFlow. You, act, you, you use something like policy-based routing for those of you who had to deal with that in the past. So you're saying, well, I want to match this particular traffic so for example, I want to match traffic from this subnet going to port 80 on that host, and I want to mirror only that traffic. So you do the significant traffic reduction on the source switch. 
you don't have to mirror a whole VLAN or one port to the span port. You can specify what traffic you want to see, and then you get only that traffic. Yet again, programmable through JSON, which means that you can have, yet again, this small script that tells the switch, I need this traffic, and you get that traffic. People are also doing that with OpenFlow, and uh, supposedly most of the data center vendors are supporting OpenFlow on their switches. So once they get all the functionality you need, you will be able to do this on more or less every data center switch on the market. Next, this is what Arista and Palo Alto demonstrated. And I think some people are using this in real life, although no one is talking much about these solutions. All firewall vendors have firewall clusters. The only problem is that because you cannot guarantee that both sides of a single flow will go over the same box, those firewall clusters never get the same performance as n individual boxes combined. Cisco is very honest. I'm, I mean, it's amazing how honest Cisco is in their documentation sometimes. They're saying you will probably get 70% of the combined throughput. So you have four 10 gig firewalls, you'll get 28 gig, not 40 gig. Because the traffic going here goes over one, the traffic going back goes over the other one, and someone has to sync state or send the mismatched packets across the shared link, whatever they're doing. Now what Arista and Palo Alto did was very simple. If I could control the traffic distribution on both ends to ensure on the switches that traffic is going back and forth through the same firewall, there would be no mismatched traffic. So I wouldn't have that problem, which means that I would squeeze more out of those same firewalls because they don't have to synchronize so many things. Okay. Uh, very simple thing, Arista implemented it actually using scripts on their switches. Uh, Arista switches run Linux. And they ship with Perl and Python on them. And you can install any RPM package you want on their switch. And they will happily tell you how to do so. It's not like some other vendors which is like, yeah, we have BSD, but don't touch it. So Arista is very happy in telling you how to break their box with uh, whatever RPM. And in this case, they actually just wrote a simple script that has to track which firewalls are active. It has to track which ports are active. So if I have only two ports here, I shouldn't use three ports here because one firewall is actually not operational. Simple things like that, you track stuff across those two switches, you synchronize them, bam, you get better performance. Not bad for a script. One other thing Palo Alto and Arista are doing, and I don't think I have a slide on that, is <laughs> extremely simple trick. Um, you have like a 10 gig firewall, and you want to firewall everything, and then you hit a backup session and the backup session eats up like eight out of those 10 gig. Why should you inspect a backup session? Well, because you don't know it's a backup session. But when you know it's a backup session, well, why don't you streamline that? Why does it have to go through the firewall? And what they did was an extremely simple trick. Uh, the Arista guys turned on syslog daemon on the Arista switch and you configure the Arista switch as syslog daemon for the Palo Alto firewall. So whenever the firewall matches a new session, it sends a syslog event to the Arista switch. And in the switch, they have this short script that analyzes the syslog. And it, if it finds something that you tell it to streamline, it inserts a shortcut rule in the forwarding table. So once the firewall recognizes that it's actually a backup session, the switch will go like, ah, gee, the firewall has found a backup session. Let's streamline it. 
And then the firewall, uh, the, the backup session bypasses the firewall. And obviously they install that thing with a certain timeout so that after a while it times out and if the backup session is still there, well, it goes back to the firewall and the firewall says, yeah, it's okay. And the switch installs the shortcut rule again. Uh, by the way, whenever I'm talking about SDN, I'm making a joke that we had SDN 20 years ago. There's even an RFC on that that is years old. And this thing is called remote triggered black hole. So when someone attacks your server, DDoS is not a new stuff. When someone attacks your server to protect everyone else, you might want to take that server offline. But if you take that server offline because this is a scene flood, it doesn't impact the attacker. So you have to install a rule at the edge of your backbone saying anything sent to that IP address has to be taken offline. And there's a very simple trick with BGP how you advertise a host route with an unreachable next hop so that all the packets that go to that host route are actually dropped on ingress. There's another trick you can use where you can use that same thing on the source IP address. So if you figure out who is attacking you, I, you can block them at the edge of uh, your network. And Cloudflare went one step further. There is this thing in, there's an old RFC about BGP flow spec, how you can do policy-based routing over BGP. Only Juniper implemented that, unfortunately, and now Cisco supposedly has it on ASR 9Ks or something. Uh, anyway, what that thing allows you to do is to push very specific entry into any one of your routers. So what Cloudflare is doing is they figure out who is attacking them, so who is attacking what on which port. And then they push the entry that blocks that traffic to the edge of their network. That's why they can survive tens of gigabits of DDoS attack. Oh, the other thing they're also doing is they're anycasting their IP addresses. So people are attacking them, but half of the traffic is going to European data center, and half the traffic is going to US data center, and the attackers don't know that. So yeah, they can survive 50 gig of combined DDoS traffic, but only 10 or 20 gigs are going to each data center, which is a cool trick. This is what a, a large number of people are already doing. It started obviously as always at universities. If you have an IDS that can only take one gig and uh, you have a 10 gig uplink like the universities do, it's pretty hard to analyze that traffic with one IDS. So you have a bank of IDSs and uh, they analyze the traffic. The only problem is how do you get the traffic to those IDSs? And usually we would use ECMP, equal cost multipathing, on the switch. So you just spray the traffic across all IDSs. The problem with that is with ECMP, you're doing statistics. So if people are doing regular stuff, all the IDSs get some of the traffic. But if someone is actually attacking you, then one IDS will be overloaded because all that traffic goes to that IDS. Okay? And the other problem is because of the way ECMP works, you may not see all sessions from the same attacker on the same IDS, which kills correlation. So what these guys are doing, they're installing deterministic entries instead of just blind ECMP on this switch. And you can then monitor those entries, let's say through OpenFlow, but you don't have to use OpenFlow for that. There, there are a number of other, other things you can use. So you monitor those entries, and once one of those entries gets too much traffic, you split it in half. And you assign half of that to some other IDS. So you can dynamically balance how the traffic gets assigned to individual IDSs. Of course, you can get one step further. Once you discover that someone is attacking you, you can then use, for example, OpenFlow controller to push the entry down here to block that traffic on the switch. 
The same thing that Cloudflare is doing with uh, their network, you can do this locally. Um, Bro IDS developers were actually thinking about implementing OpenFlow on Bro IDS just for this reason. But uh, then they decided that, ah, we are not doing that. They implemented a generic mechanism where you, they can call your script, telling your script, this is what you need to block. And then you can use OpenFlow or Arista's tools or Cisco's 1PK or whatever you have, or BGP flow spec if you're using Juniper, to block that traffic at the edge of your network. So all this sounds great, right? Why are we not doing it? Which brings me to the roadblocks. It's the mindset. <laughs> Roadblock number one is the mindset, and the roadblock number two is processes and procedures. If you don't change these two, well, including the third one, you will not get anywhere. And obviously, you can't just go back to your CSO and tell him that we need to change everything. He will ask you, what were you smoking in Heidelberg? So the only thing you can do is you can get like-minded people from different teams and you, force, you form this guerrilla force and you have a small pilot and you prove that this thing actually works. And then you find one of the cool application developers teams and you work with them so they succeed. And when they succeed, you use them as the shining example of, hey, it can be done. <laughs> If you don't want to do it, that's fine with me. <laughs> but look at what those guys are doing. That's the only way forward I see. Uh, and then, of course, there are the external road, road, roadblocks like licensing. Every vendor loves to charge you by box. For example, uh, F5 charges you by box, even in virtual world. I was told yesterday that virtual licenses are even more expensive than physical boxes, which makes absolutely no sense, but such is life. Uh, Palo Alto with their virtual firewall with VMware NSX, they need a virtual firewall on every host. And obviously you have to buy a license for every host in your network which is like a nice money machine for some people. Uh, there's also the problem with auditing tools. Most auditing tools are licensed per node. So if you have 100 small firewalls instead of two humongous firewalls, they want to charge you 50 times more, even though the number of rule sets is actually lower. But that's how licensing works. Sometimes you have to live with that. Sometimes you find a better vendor and you vote with your wallet. And sometimes open source is just good enough. And if the application was developed in the last two years and you have to use F5 instead of Varnish or Squid or HA Proxy, something is fundamentally wrong with your application development process. Such life. Okay, does it work today? Yes, it does. On the virtual appliance vendors you have all side, you have all major firewall and load balancing vendors. Licensing is a different story, but they have a product. Distributed firewalls, you have VMware, NSX, you have Palo Alto, you have Hyper-V, you have a few other things. Orchestration tools, all the major cloud orchestration tools support this concept. And on the automation side, people are using tools like Ansible, Chef, or Puppet that are traditionally used to manage servers, to manage switches, firewalls, load balancers. Palo Alto has just released an Ansible plugin, which means that you can manage a Palo Alto firewall through Ansible. Arista has Ansible, Chef, and Puppet plugins. Uh, Juniper has Puppet running on their switches. Cisco has Jeff and Puppet somewhere. I don't remember where exactly. 
So everyone is working on that. So there are no excuses. Start now. Okay. And finally, this is my own Gartner slide. Some people know how much I love industry analysts. <laughs> and we were always making fun of Gartner, but actually they're writing some good stuff. So this is my own Gartner slide. This, is, this was a blog post that someone from Gartner wrote on shiny new object syndrome, <laughs> which effectively says, don't be dazzled by the shiny new objects. Figure out whether this fits into your organization. Figure out whether you could do the same thing just by changing your policy or process. Figure out whether you have to go with a new vendor or maybe your vendor will have this in a year because you won't be ready in a year anyway. Um, can we fix 85% of the problems with existing tools? And usually you can. You just require a change in policy or process. And finally, do we have the right stuff? And there, well, this is now 30 seconds of blatant self-promotion. I do have a lot of material on automation, and particular network automation, and the tools and the technology you can use. So if you want to dive deeper into that, there are like, you see, 10 different things that you can watch. And finally, stay in touch. If you have comments on this presentation, I'll be around for the next three days. So just grab me and we'll have a chat. Send me an email. Uh, I am running a podcast on software defined everything. And usually the guests are pretty interesting. So go and listen to that podcast. I mean, it's there because of the guests, not because I want to promote my stuff. Uh, and if you have if you ever have any follow-up questions, send me an email. I try to answer all of them. Sometimes it just may take time because I'm a trooper. With that, thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you. Uh, I would say we have uh, five minutes for Q&A. Frankfurt about a month ago and this guy presented uh, how he has his Hadoop cluster on the internet without a firewall in front mm -hmm. because he would need 250 of the largest Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here was uh, a question saying uh, there was this guy at this presentation uh, who said that he's running his Hadoop cluster straight connected straight to the internet because it would take him to much money to build the firewall in front of it. That's right? He said 250 of the biggest Palo Altos. Yeah, 250 biggest Palo Altos would be a few terabits, which is uh, one top of rack switch. So yeah, he's right. Um, all the big web properties supposedly don't use firewalls at all. That's what I've been told from several sources. You have IP tables on your Linux box, and you can use IP tables pretty successfully to uh, protect that host, assuming you know how to harden and protect the host, which is why we don't use that approach in enterprise networks, because we can't trust the people who are supposed to be hardening that host. Uh, web properties have totally different processes and they have one deployment that goes out to that whole farm of web servers so they can afford that. Uh, second, uh, you can use IP tables and then depending on what he wanted to do with that Hadoop cluster. Uh, if he just needed external access to it, then he could use packet filters to protect it because external access to Hadoop cluster is on port 80 or 443 or whatever they're using. And there is no need for anything else. So you just install packet filters that do that. Uh, going out obviously is a different story. And there uh, I, 
know someone who solved that by installing effectively policy-based routing, saying for incoming sessions we go straight and back, and for all the outgoing sessions, so all the weird stuff that would need to be firewalled, I will send it off to a firewall, but that is way less than the incoming and return traffic. Make sense? Thanks again, Ivan. We close the session here.